All right, we are live. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to the AppCon 2022 uh, con hybrid conference. And we are kick starting the uh, conference three days before that, before the actual event itself, with a pre conference webinar uh, from one of our uh, sponsoring partners for AppCon 2022, which is Agile and Technologies. We are very proud to have Agile and Technologies on board uh, for the conference. And uh, this is going to be an exciting event that is the 70th National Conference of Indian Association of Pathologists and Macrobiologists and IAPID, Indian Academy of Pathologists, Indi Indi International Div Indian Division. And uh, this will be the 70th uh, event, and we will be having 2,000 plus registered delegates who will be traveling in from across the country to Bangalore. And Bangalore, the garden city, the Silicon Valley of India, is all set to host them in three days from now. So to kick off the webinar, I welcome our organizing chairperson of the AppCon 2022 and our president of KCIPM, Dr. Nandakishore Alva, out of the meeting. Hello, sir. Welcome. And I also welcome uh, uh, Ms. Shamian D. Chair, who is uh, the representing Agile and Technologies all the way from Singapore here. And the faculty for this particular session is uh, Dr. Maria Salguero. And she'll be talking to us. She's a medical uh, affairs EQA specialist at Agile Technologies, and she has done extensive work on PDL1 IT staining. And she's going to be sharing some of her experiences on that and helping us solve the nitty gritties of PDL1 staining and the importance of pre analytics through a topic essential pre analytics and best practices for PDL1 uh, staining, IT staining. Uh, Alva, sir, just to kick off, I just request you to make the welcome remarks before we hand over the stage to Ms. Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aditya, for uh, introducing the entire event. And uh, we are actually delighted and excited to have our conference kicking stop at Ram uh, uh, our conference kicking stop. I mean, kicking start at uh, MS Ramay Medical College, Bangalore. And uh, <clears throat> as uh, Dr. Aditya was rightly pointing out, this is one of the largest conference uh, of pathologists uh, across the country, and uh, this is named as APCON. 2022, and this is a hybrid conference as well, and there will be uh, more than 2,000 delegates who will be participating in this conference, and most of them are on travel to Bangalore, I think, right from tomorrow. Uh, <clears throat> so we welcome all the delegates, as well as the participants in this uh, uh, very exciting and very uh, um, delightful conference that is going to start from 30th of November. So as a part of uh, a pre-conference CME, we are having this uh, uh, um, meeting with the Agile Technologies, who are our, our Rhodium sponsors for APCON 2022. And I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Maria uh, S. Uh, Laurerio, Chief Medical Officer and EQS Specialist of Agile Technologies, to enlighten us about uh, um, the, her presentation uh, in this conference. And uh, <clears throat> as Dr. Aditya was pointing out our conference, actually kick starts on 30th of this month, that is um, um, 30th of November, which will be a pre-conference CME, around more than uh, 15 pre-conference CMEs and workshops will be happening all across Bangalore city. And on the first, we have the international conference that is happening in Ramaya. And from the um, second onwards, we have the national AppCon conference that is happening in Ramaya from uh, 1st of uh, uh, um, uh, December till 4th of December. So thank you very much for uh, being our uh, Rhodium sponsors for the conference. And uh, I welcome Dr. Uh, Maria to this conference. And uh, uh, we are very excited to hear from you, Madam. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to welcome you to this webinar. Um, and, <clears throat> and first of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us and dedicating your time to learning more about PDL1 and also thank the conference organization for giving us the opportunity to be with you today to bring us to you our experience. I will start sharing my presentation and please let me know when you can see my screen. <clears throat> yes, we can see the screen now. You may go ahead. Okay, perfect. Oh. So today I'm trying to bring my experience to talk about the importance of pre-analytics and how it can help us to get the best results for PDL 122C3. The learning objectives and agenda for today are starting with 
an outline of the journey of a tissue specimen, how precision medicine requires precision pathology, following by understanding the pre-analytical factors, how a poor fixation leads to poor tissue quality that can impact diagnosis and treatment decisions, among others, and to finalize describing the best practices to optimize tissue preservation and PDL1 quality, providing you with tools to control the results that can be controlled tissue and also EQH. As you know, there is no precision medicine without precision pathology. Therefore, the diagnostics tests like PDL1 are necessary to provide the right diagnosis to the right patient that allows treating correctly at the right time through all the entire patient journey. And what happened to the patient tissue specimen during its journey? The reality is that from surgical room where the patient specimen is viable to the moment when the pathologist look at it under the microscope, there are different moments in which any error compromises the diagnosis. And the more steps, the more risk of human errors. So <clears throat> all professionals involved in the patient sample management should implement a coordinated evidence-based program to meet the, requir the requirements of precision medicine. Because how this precision medicine looks like, for example, in a lung cancer patient. Years ago, the testing process was simple. After sometimes with an amatoxin, it was enough. But today, more and more steps are needed to make an accurate diagnosis using immunostochemistry, pharmacodiagnostic tests, PIS, NDS, CTDNA, and more are coming. So the assessment of these biomarkers in patient tissue specimens play a critical and growing role in precision medicine and will continue to increase. So as we can see in the chart, where a lung cancer patient arrives of the pathology department will follow two groups. Cases only diagnosed by, based on the hematoxylin, uh, there are minimum ones, and more commonly, cases starting with an hematoxylin by requires immunostochemistry for diagnostic classification, in this case P40 and TTF1, and then different biomarkers like ALK, ROS1, PDL1 are needed to decide the treatment. So more than ever, how well we treat the tissue specimen will decide the treatment. And from the moment the sample is taken from the patient, we see in the previous slide that there are different phases until the final diagnosis. We have the pre-analytical phase that involves any actions or factors involved when we acquire, handle, transport, and process the patient specimen. The analytical part, there is all the factors related to the testing process and the instruments, the platforms of the test and the post-analytical, all the interpretation and reporting. And based on the different literature, they estimate that between 60 to 70% of errors of the diagnosis are due to the pre-analytical factors. That's why we are here. And also if we talk about PDL1 immunostochemistry test and taking this uh, paper from Dr. Taylor, and the statement that said immunostochemistry is technically complex and no aspect of this complexity can be ignored from the moment of collecting the tissue to the final report. So we need to take care of the three phases, the pre-analytical, the analytical, and the post-analytical to really achieve an optimal result. And we, when we mix the three phases and the CDX test like PDL1, that is a ready to use antibody, ready to stay in protocol. The analytical phase is already validated. So if we are going to mess up, it's going to be related to pre-analytical or post-analytical. So specimen handling, pre-analytical factors, 
are essential to really ensure reliability and accuracy of biomarkers test results. But what are the analytical variables? The pre-analytical phase involves the steps of tissue collection, call ischemia, that we need to have proper biopsies. We don't allow tissue to dry. We need to be fixated as soon as possible. Uh, it, it, the best it would be less than one hour. We need to take care of the fixation, the time, the, the fixative, the grossing and the processing, how if there is any cross-contamination, if it is over-processed, under-processed tissue, <clears throat> how we make the block, how we cut, how we store, and how we micro to me, how we can do this micro to me, because everything needs to be standardized to have good results. And just having a look on the literature, they tell us that there are many analytical variables that can affect protein detection. And what's more, I really like the question on the right, on the paper on the right, how well do you know our FFPE specimen, how well we know our tissue. Because in the article, it comments that there are some variables that have already been evaluated, the call ischemia, the calcification, the time of the fixation, is something that we normally have in mind. There are others that are incomplete, like how is the size, how is the buffer, the reagents, the slides, but there's still a lot that remain unknown like the ink that we use in the grossing, uh, how the paraffin is uh, um, conserved, how good is the paraffin impregnation embedding, and more, more on. So there are many more factors that can affect potential effects on DNA, protein, morphology. And the, the, the article below said that Pathology practice needs to ensure integrity of cancer patients for precision medicine. So, just an overview of the complexity and the different variabilities that the pre-analytical phase could have, because depending on the conditions that we chose in each of the steps, the results can be different. So there are many, many opportunities for variables across pre-analytical pathway to impact testing. Today, we are just looking at some of the pre-analytical factors, but because of the time, we are only be able to scratch the surface. And the CAP also said something about it. And they are, for them, there are six sources of errors that can really impact the specimens. There is call ischemia time, the method of fixation, the method of processing, the tissue processor, the storage, and how well we document it. Well, let's start with the fixation and with the call ischemia. It's really uh, alarming that literature warns us that 40% of errors of the diagnosis are related to fixation. So it's the first step that we need to standardize if we want to move forward. And it is not only important the fixation time, but also the ischemia time, because it's important that the tissue place immediately in fixative after the removal from the patient. It's a key uh, starting time where uh, the, the tissue will start to degrade. So to prevent errors in this phase, it's really important to follow the recommendation. Starting from the time from the removal and the placement in fixative, the call ischemia time, it needs to be the less as possible. And the recommendation is one hour or less. And the time that the tissue is immersed in fixative is really important too. And it said, the literature said that at least six hours and not more than 24 to 72 hours, depending on the type of uh, biomarker and on the type of a specimen. 
specifically for the PDL122 Pharmacy's kit, it has been validated between 12 to 72 hours. And it also is verified that if your fixation time is less or equal to three hours, the, the detection of PDL1 is not the same, it has variability. And we think that it's important to understand why fixation is so important, the way that the fixation works. Because choosing the recommended 10% uh, neutral buffer formalin, that is the gold standard, it has been used for more than 70 years. But and also it's the one validated for the PDL1 kit. The formalin stabilizes target proteins and antigens, but it has an odd pattern. It works following three different phases. Phase one, the penetration is really fast. Phase two, there is the binding that is moderate. But the phase three, there is the chemical reaction where all the cross-linking reactions with proteins takes uh, place. It's really slow. It can take more or less 24 hours depending on the specimen size. So every uh, time that we change the time on fixation, it will affect the staining, the sensitivity, the specificity, the background, the morphology. So any under or over fixation, any delay in fixation will affect SA results. That's why it's really important to separate correctly the areas that we want to examine, place immediately in the formal, the formalin to help initiate this formalin penetration and good tissue fixation. And it's important to record when the fixation starts. Record, it's important to record when the, the tissue is taken from the patient. So every step needs to be recorded and have the knowledge of how many times it happens from one step to the other. Because if not, we take the risk that because the formalin penetrates a uh, way of penetration of the fixative, it's often happened that the periphery is well fixed, but the center is not. As you can see in the image on the right, the white arrows shows how far formalin has penetrated into the tissue, <clears throat> and the center you can see there is unfixed. So when we shorten in the fixation, when there is no formal fixation, the post fixation ends up taking place in the alcohols of the dehydration and the results are unpredictable. This is the reason why large specimens need to be open to facilitate this penetration and secure good fixation. Because the reality is that we can see the impact already on the metoxylin when the fixation is not correctly done. On the left, we have a small intestine that were immediately put under fixation, so the mucosa is completely intact. Similar small intestine, when the fixation has a delay, then the mucosa starts to shed. And on the right, we have an endometrial biopsy, where because of this Incomplete fixation, the nucleus are blur, so it's difficult to make a, make a diagnosis also in this hematoxylin. But on the immunostochemistry, the impact is more visible, and there are several articles that review the consequence when we have this delay to formal fixation, longer cold ischemia, how this delay really impact the progressively deteriorate antigen detection and compromise the diagnostic result. In the slide, we have different ER clones staining in breast cancer tissue, and we can see how it's lost the longer the cold ischemia time the tissue is exposed to. So the staining is uh, being weaker, almost absent in some cases. And excuse me to put breast, in ER when we are talking about PD-1, but there are a lot of articles talking about CDX or uh, biomarkers in press rather than the, uh, with a lot of images that I couldn't really take at the same 
for their LAN or PDL one. And same tissue pattern happens when there are insufficient fixation or when are prolonged fixation. The results are completely different depending on the fixation time. For example, on the left, with a proper fixation, P67 shows 33% proliferation rate versus on scenario B, with a short uh, uh, fixation, only express 5%. And if we look on the key 67 on the right, we can see how, depending on the hours of fixation, a sample with 41% in case A go to 70% um, when we prolong the fixation, and the same happens in case B. From 74% of proliferation, it goes to 13%. So the treatment will be different depending on the proliferation too. and how we see this type of uh, poor fixation under the microscope. I, if you remember the kidney with the red area of poor fixation and the white arrows where it was a, a good penetration, well, we have the same under the microscope. We see that uh, the edge have adequate fixation because the fixative it diffuse into the tissue. So we can see that TTF1 has a good staining but as soon as we are moving to the center where there is incorrect penetration the staining is weak i could say absent in this case so we can see that types of uh, problems when we are under the microscope with immunostochemistry and the same happens with pdl1 standardization is more and more important when we talk about cdx because any suboptimal fixation on tissue may give error results. As published by Seth et al., where the delay fixation has impact the PDL1 expression. In this study, they show that PDL1 expression was reduced after one hour delay to fixation, and it changed from TPS low to negative. And we also change from TPS high to TPS low. And not only the delay deteriorating membrane staining, but also increase a lot non specific staining that can give also errors when we are scoring PDL1. So, depending on the delay or the prolonged fixation, the result of PDL1 will change the treatment. At the same time, it happens also to other central immunostochemistry markers for, PDL, for lung cancer, like TTF1 and P40, the study. And we, we just have a, a search online. There are a lot of articles talking about how cold ischemia, cold ischemia time have impact on both molecular immunostaining, and most of them show that the status can change from being positive to negative and changing this treatment decision just because not following the recommendation for fixation. So just before moving to the next pre-analytical variable, remember that time, temperature, and volume is really important for an optimal fixation following the guidelines on time. Don't increase temperature to be uh, to accelerate because it accelerates also the enzyme degradation of tissue. And the volume is important. The ratio from fixative to tissue specimen, it needs to be a good volume to really have uh, really enough to penetrate the tissue. And the next step is tissue processing. I don't know if you are familiar with, but uh, the purpose of this process is to transform the cut section into a form hard enough to cut it into very thin sections. And it, it happens on the process where it happens three different steps, starting with the alcohol that extracts water from the tissue. And the alcohol has just like formally a fast penetration time. So if there was too short fixation in formalin, 
it induced to a hybrid fixation with alcohol. But as the alcohol extracts the water, so does small components and proteins in the tissue will do the same if it is not well fixed. So it's really important to know that when we make this hybrid fixation with alcohol, it will affect the antigens. Step two, we use saline to remove the alcohol. And in step three, we will infuse the tissue with paraffin so the specimen is now ready to, to embed in. So it's also important to take in consideration the tissue processing to really have good immunostochemistry results. Because if it is poorly processed, it will give poor results. So just check how it's maintenance, how the rotation of the, of the reagents, how it's validated, and all the sections need to be um, recorded. So every time that we make uh, or we see a poor uh, immunostochemistry statement, we can check it what will happen during the process. Microtomy. Well, now that we have our block embedded and we are ready to cut, a lot of you are probably thinking that ah, now we are home safe. But it's not true. The section is very important, especially for markers like PDL1, where counting is part of the interpretation. So it needs to, it's important to check which type of knife you are taking, which temperature, but importantly, which section thickness you have. Because choosing sections will not necessarily give the same expression as, as uh, uh, three microliters and can also affect the outcome of your staining. On the image on the right, there is an example that the same tissue was stained with the same protocol, but with different section thickness. And we can see that the thicker the tissue section is, the stronger is the staining, the more difficult it is to count out. And the same with the, um, the one that is one micro, it does not have the same staining as the three one. Once well, we have our tissue in the slide, it is incredibly important how we write. The guidelines or literature offer us different ways, 24 hours at room temperature, overnight to 37 degrees, one hour at between 50 to 60. But for PDL1, it's really a key to put to place them in the oven for one hour around 60 degrees. And it's important to take the time to be there because if we have paraffin residuals, it may lead to false negative results. But it's important also to be just one hour, not more, because it is already on the literature that the step of slide drying has actually been proved to have a really impact on some staining. We take in consideration the HER2 test because it's one of the oldest CDX antibodies that has shown uh, problems. The staining seems too weak. And when they check it, all the different parameters, they see that the only thing that have changed was the dry of the tissue. And when it was dried for too long, a too high temperature, so they ensure that the tissue did not fall off. But what they see is that the staining of three plants on the top, when it was for more time and a bit more temperature, the staining was coming from three plants to one zero plus. And the same with the two plus on the low image, where again, when the temperature was 16, but it was for more time, then you see a significantly loss in intensity and also in the cells that are stained. So up close, it is clear that this arrow will change the course of treatment for this patient. And another important thing is that many of the antigens have lost uh, the expression depending on the cut section storage because time, temperature, water in the slide, 
humidity in the room, light, all of them affects negatively to the antigen preservation. And the Pharmadix PDL1 guideline is really clear to recommend that you have to hold the tissue section in the fridge as the option preferred for a maximum of six months before staining. Because if not, the integrity and antigenicity could change. So now we know that we have limited lifespan for our cut sections, but sadly it was also discovered that our blocks also have a li limited lifetime. In this study for 2019, they proved that the expression was higher in section from fresh blocks compared to fresh cut section from blocks that have been archived for more than five years. And it is something that is also expressed in the guidelines for PDL1, which said that blocks which are five years or older may result in a loss of PDL1 immunoreactivity. So now we see that there are a lot of things that can be with problems during the different steps of pre-analytical. So how we can really uh, use tools to help us in our daily today to secure our results. Uh, one thing that can monitor it, that can prevent it, is the use of controls. We can use controls to control our results. And we have different types of controls. The control line, it's cell lines that can only control the staining procedure. So the control lines on the kit will indicate that the reagent is working properly, that nothing happened during the transportation or during the in the fridge. The positive and control tissue, it will be tissue with a PDL1 positive cells. And we control that the tissue was correctly prepared and it was proper staining procedure. The negative control tissue, we will have tissues that have cells that are expected to be PDL1 negative, and you will control the specificity of the primary antibody that it was not cross uh, staining with other things rather than the PDL1. And the negative control reagent will detect non specific background staining. The ideal positive control tissue must provide a complete dynamic representation of weak to moderate cell membrane staining because it's the only way to really see rapidly under the microscope that these weakly uh, cells that express PDL1 in the beginning will stop expressing it, it will be absent staining, so it will alert us that something has gone wrong. Of course, if we want to check that our, our staining has been uh, correctly uh, done, the tissue that we use as the controls need to be processes, fixed, embedded the same manner as our patient sample, because if not, we cannot control the pre analytical of our lab. And in the case of PDL1, what is expected to have is specimens on the same tumor indication, and tonsil can be used also as an optimal control tissue because it shows the different range of PDL1 expressing. And I don't know if all the participants are familiar with the name EQA, but it's also a tool available to review our results and to be confident with our results. EQA means external quality assurance, and it is a system for objectively checking how the laboratory is performing using an independent external agency or facility. The importance of an EQA program is that it can improve and is your routine PDL1 testing or any other test, but in this case we are talking about PDL1 to help your lab maintain reporting of high quality result. EQA will check if the analytical and post-analytical part is well done 
checking the staining pattern, the scoring, using their own control. So EQA will give you the controls, you will stain it, you will scoring, and they will give the feedback about how this PDL1 quality is uh, for the intended purpose. So this participation of the standard quality will provide you valuable data of are my results correct, are my PDL1 results correct. And EQA proves that also, when we have the pre-analytical part under control, the analytical part, I mean the antibody we use, can completely change the result. So today we were focused on how pre-analytical uh, can change the result because when we use a CDX, the part of the analytical is correctly done. And this uh, study from Nordic UC, there is a Danish EQA and UK Nekes and UK uh, EQA. It shows that when we use a laboratory development test, so we need to validate also not only our pre-analytical, we need to validate our analytical phase. Compare when we use the companion diagnostic are more complicated and it's more risk. Because when we check the percentage of acceptable staining, <clears throat> false negative, and or false positive staining each of them has. It concludes that the use of LDTs, laboratory development tests, rather than CTX, reached 27% of all results. And the past majority was due to false negative. So if these EQA controls have been patient sampled to the nose, more than 20% will have been denied possibly beneficial treatment. And more than 5% will have received treatment that was not likely to be effective when using an LDT. So we are coming to the end of the session and we will just want to make a short summary. Some questions for you to think about it. Uh, after my talk, it's, is there is room for improving in your lab? How can you do to implement change to improve cold ischemia time, tissue handling to really take in consideration the pre-analytical? Could be good to have all stakeholders involved uh, of the custody of the tissue sample to identify metrics and process for the collection, to have all the workflow process recorded, and really always always have in mind that the false results can impact patient treatment decision. And I want to emphasize this last one, because this poor tissue fixation, which poor tissue handle the colis ischemia time, we have seen in the different slides that can result in false negative biomarkers. So this patient can be erroneously denied consideration for the effective target therapy and also how we validate our LDT could lead to the same. And on the other hand, a patient could also receive a therapy that not benefit from due to different pre-analytical or analytical errors. So I will close my talk with an advice from Professor Carolyn Compton, that is an academic pathologist, chair of the Precision Medicine Corps of American Cancer and Chair also of the Pre-Analytical for Precision Medicine Project, among other responsibilities, that said that we may make every effort to safeguard the molecular quality of patient specimens during the pre-analytical period if we want to generate valid analytical data on which to base valid diagnostic decisions. Regardless of how much effort is involved and how far we have to go to ensure full quality control, we need to remember that it's all worth it for one reason, our patient. They are counting on us. So thank you so much for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Maria, for sharing your experience here. Uh, audience, if there's any questions, please post in the YouTube chat box uh, so that we can uh, post it to the faculty here. Uh, before that, uh, Dr. Agasso, any uh, comments on this session?
delegates, please note uh, you may post your queries in the YouTube chat box so that we can post it to the faculty. Any questions, please? I don't think we have any questions. Uh, Ms. Maria and Ms. Shamian, uh, thank you, I think, for that enlightening lecture. I think a lot of uh, points for us to introspect on the way uh, the pre-analytics phase works uh, here and uh, to implement better strategies to uh, eventually give a better patient care to all the uh, patients. Uh, we need to work on this, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Shamian and Ms. Maria Sergei for joining us here and for the talk. Uh, any questions? We will just connect you with uh, the delegates soon because the YouTube live stream continues to stay on the YouTube forever. So we might get more questions later on also. So we will just connect you with the delegates when and where they have a question so that you can address them at the point. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us here. Ms. Shaman, any comments? Final words from your side? No, I'd just like to thank all the delegates. I'd like to thank APCON, Dr. Aditya, Dr. Elva for inviting us today and giving us the chance and also Maria the chance to share about um, you know, Agilent's experience and also Maria's own experience with pre-analytics. We think this is very important for successful PDL one 22 c 3 ihc staining, and uh, we look forward to further engagement. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mary, any last, mm -hmm. other last comments from your side? Yes, thank you for the attention. I, I just uh, make a emphasis on what Charmin said. The pre-analytic really have an impact on any immunostochemistry, but more in the CDX, PDL1, 22C3. It is more important how we score and how the antigen is preserved. So anything that uh, we can help, we are just here. And uh, if you have questions later on, just send for us and we will be happy to connect with you later. Thank you, Ms. Maria. PDL1 is a buzzword when it comes to all research activities now, and everybody's ca conducting a research on PDL1 and its implementation, its impact in uh, cancer management and targeted therapies. And this session, I think, will uh, go a long way in guiding people on the importance of pre analytical stage uh, to get the right uh, diagnosis and help the uh, uh, cater to the treatment strategies much better way uh, because the diagnosis, a right diagnosis mean, will mean a right treatment. Uh, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very enlightening talk, uh, and uh, we're happy to have you on board here. And we will probably continue to have more sessions from uh, Agilent uh, uh, to enlighten our audience further. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.